A lot of what I do is in the field of primary immunodeficiency, but looking at the field of allergy and immunology and some of the advances, specifically in biologics, have um, for the most part been, been occurring in asthma. So I'm going to focus on most of these drugs are still in clinical trials, but I'm going to just kind of review where we're at as a field. We're clearly not as far along as a lot of the rheumatology medications, but um, hopefully we'll be catching up. So just a, one quick slide about some of the disease states and some of the advances in the overall in the field of uh, clinical allergy and immunology. There's been a few things in the last few years, primary immunodeficiency, we've had the advent of new uh, monthly subcutaneous immunoglobulin treatment. Um, hyper eosinophilic syndrome, they're looking into some of these same medications that we're using for asthma with the anti-IL-5 therapy. Um, IG, Anti-IgE therapy or omalizumab has now been approved for chronic idiopathic urticaria and that's been new in the last few years and there's some different monoclonal antibodies that they're using in atopic dermatitis. But like I said, what I'm going to focus on is asthma, which is moving rapidly, actually, in the, in the field of biologics. So asthma, we know, is a huge burden, not only financially, but clinically. Uh, Dr. Calabrese yesterday, you know, one of his slides showed how some of these diseases, TB, and I forget which, one, which other ones in the last 20 or 50 years, are coming down and some of these are going dr dramatically up and one of those on his slide was asthma. And whether this is because of environmental factors or the microbiome, we're not sure, but you know, there's estimates that the uh, number of people with asthma worldwide will increase by 25% in the next 15 years. So it's already a huge burden and we think it's only going to become more burdensome. So a little bit has been known already prior to the last maybe five or ten years on the pathogenesis or phenotyping of asthma. A lot of this we think is, you know, allergen mediated or viral mediated where we have triggering of the immune system. A lot of these pathways we touched on yesterday and we can polarize into either a Th1 or Th2 uh, phenotype and in some circumstances trigger the B cell into isotype switching and creating IgE which can then downstream cause uh, degranulation of mast cells and eosinophil activation and bronchospasm and all the different symptoms that we see with asthma. So in, until recently we've been using pretty much this guideline in general to treat all patients with asthma. So, you know, it's, it's what we call step-up therapy and start with just you know, albuterol or short-acting beta agonists for people that have intermittent or mild asthma. And this, this sort of step-up therapy of adding um, inhaled corticosteroids or long-acting beta agonists each step up is kind of based on symptoms. So we, don't, we haven't been really looking at the phenotypes or biomarkers of these patients with asthma, but just taking them as a whole. Okay, you're an asthmatic. How many times do you wake at night coughing? How, what are your symptoms? And have been pretty much basing our therapy based on pretty only on symptoms. I'm not going to get used to this mouse thing. But there's been a push now, in not just in asthma, but I think in a lot of different diseases, especially diseases that are so heterogeneous as asthma, to you know, tr more, better try to phenotype patients. So there's patients that have a lot of symptoms, but don't have a lot of inflammation. So their symptoms are more than inflammation. There's people that clearly have sort of a proportional amount of inflammation as they have symptoms and some that have the inflammation way outweighs their symptoms. So we're looking more at ways of personalizing medicine and personalizing the therapy. 
so this slide is kind of busy, but a lot of this, I, I hopefully, um, so, at least some of this you remember from yesterday and looking at um, the TH2 signal and a lot of the different cytokines that are associated with TH2 activation and how the TH2 activation can trigger B cells. And what has been known for a long time about the asthma uh, pathobiology is that we think allergens play a big role and therefore IgE is you know, potentially a major factor in the pathogenesis. So the first sort of biologic that we had and we've had for a while targets IgE. So you probably all have heard about this one. This is the omalizumab, which is a humanized monoclonal antibody against IgE and it binds circulating IgE regardless of the specificity of the IgE, whether it's to dog or cat or pollen. So it binds to any free IgE and forms these complexes so that IgE can't activate downstream signals. So the, the downstream effect of um, binding free IgE is obviously you reduce your serum levels of free IgE. It down-regulates the re IgE receptors on mast cells and basophils. And hopefully then the theory was that it would reduce um, eosinophilia, T cells, B cells, and inflammation in the airways of patients with asthma. So when you look at this, these are um, bronchial biopsies of patients that have been on omalizumab for 16 weeks. And as you can see versus placebo, we have this big decrease in eosinophils, IgE positive cells, um, FC receptor positive cells, and IL-4 cells in the, in the bronchial biopsies of patients that were on omalizumab for 16 weeks. And what we saw clinically was that there was this decrease in exacerbation. So all these patients, these omalizumab was used as an add-on therapy. So once we got to that final step in that step-up therapy, so they rem remained on the high-dose um, inhaled corticosteroids with LABA, but omalizumab was added, added on at that last step. And what we saw is that there was, you know, 50 or 44 percent decrease in asthma exacerbations and emergency room visits. But what wasn't seen, and I think, you know, when people thought about this when they first were, this was coming out, was this, this was going to have a much more dramatic effect and we'd have improvement in FEV1 and lung function and reversibility and maybe even bronchial wall thickening. And none of that was really seen. It was really only in sort of the severe, the incidence of exacerbation in ER visits. So, you know, going back and looking at this diagram and looking at the pathobiology of asthma, uh, um, a lot of people thought, you know, maybe we could take a step further back and try to target some of these other TH2 cytokines. And if we can target TH2 cytokines, that'll have a bigger global impact on asthma. So what we knew is that, um, just to review a little bit from yesterday, the TH1 cells mediate macrophage, macrophage activation and produces interferon gamma, which causes a lot of inflammation. And the TH2 uh, cells mediate, in general, the allergic response and produce their um, cytokine, cytokine profile with IL-4, IL-5, IL-9, IL-13. So these were some of the the targets um, look when we looked at some possible therapeutic options to treat asthma. And it was also known that these cytokines were increased in the airways of asthmatics. So when you looked at BAL in patients with asthmatics, you can see that, let me see if I can, IL-5 is increased. GMCSF, but then if you look at like interferon, gamma, it's not, it's not as increased. So the, a lot of the patients with asthma seem to have a TH2 fingerprint. So the, the one of the, the cytokine that we're furthest along in and actually was just approved was, is uh, an antibody to IL-5. 
So IL-5 plays a role in recruitment and maturation of eosinophils at sites of inflammation. And as we saw in the previous slide, um, IL-5 is increased in not only the BAL, but bronchial biopsies of patients with asthma. And actually the levels of IL-5, and these are in mouse models, correlates directly with the severity of disease. So mepolizumab, it is used in multiple different diseases, but um, has been was originally the clinical trials were used in asthma. It's a human monoclonal antibody against free IL-5, and in the first trials, it was sort of they took all patients with asthma, didn't try to use any biomarkers, and looked at you know treatment with mep mepolizumab as add-on therapy. And they saw that it did decrease the eosinophil numbers in the blood and in the airway of patients with asthma, but didn't really have any um, significant improvement in the symptoms or FEV1 or bronchial hyperresponsiveness. So the second sort of step at this was to look at this and try to tease out a phenotype that maybe um, mepolizumab was better suited for. So they looked only at patients with severe asthma that had signs of eosinophilic inflammation. So eosinophils either in the sputum or eosinophils in the blood or a couple of other, you know, increased FENO, uh, so other biomarkers that would help us think that they might have some eosinophilic inflammation. And in this study, it was... Um, a uh, double-blind, placebo-controlled study. It was multi-center, and they gave um, three, do three different doses of IV mepolizumab versus control. And I believe Dr. Looney had one of these slides yesterday, but this is one of the slides from the trials, which is one of the doses. And as you can see, just I guess like omelizumab, if you look at the number of exacerbations with placebo versus mepolizumab, we do have a decrease in exacerbations. And if you look at the number of people and their number of exacerbations, the curve is shifted to the left, meaning that the patients on mepolizumab had a, a much um, decreased incidence of exacerbations as compared to keeping the patients just on the, the highest in the step-up therapy. The actual data showed there was a 39 to 48% decrease depending on what dose they got. There were small effects on FEV1 and quality of life scores, but they weren't very significant. And there was a mild but not significant reduction in the thickness of the bronchial wall. And interesting, this didn't have any, it had no, um, there was uh, the atopic status or the Ig level were, weren't um, responsible for whether the, you know, didn't correlate with response to mepolizumab. So this was approved in November, mepolizumab, and I know talking at some of the people at our table, it's being used around the country. We've used it a few times in our office. Um, so it's a once a month subcutaneous injection. It's approved for patients with severe asthma, with adults, and with some type of biomarkers that there's eosinophilia. So this is the only other medication besides omelizumab, or biologic besides omelizumab, that's already approved for asthma. So I'm going to review just a few um, of the biologics that are in the works and some of the uh, mechanisms and theories behind them. So one of those is the anti-IL-5 receptor antibody. So this just like anti -IL, or like the anti-IL-5 will block the activations of eosinophils by IL-5, but it also binds to the IL-5 receptor and kills the cells that have that receptor. So it um, will actually kill eosinophils and basophils that carry these receptors. And what that'll give us is that you can give a single dose that can last eight to 12 weeks. So benralizumab is, is one of these drugs. It's been, um, there was one small trial where there was, um, there was 27 patients with asthma that had high eosinophil count, sputum counts. And they received either 
um, 100 milligrams of benralizumab or 200 and placebo at day 0, 28, or 56. And this is just a small n. And if you just sort of look at this from far, you know, a distance, you can tell that the, this is the treatment arms and this is the placebo. Just in general, the sputomyosinophils are decreased in the treatment arms and this is the peripheral blood eosinophilia. So it seems to be effective maybe in this, this phenotype in decreasing in eosinophilia. They're not far enough along to see how, how well, you know, what this does clinically, but it seems that in certain patients that eosin eosinophilia is a big part of their asthma, that this could be a potential medication and maybe have um, dosing benefits over that of mepolizumab. Another drug that's being looked at is the IL-4 and IL-13, um, anti-IL-4 and IL-13 monoclonal antibodies. So we know that IL-4 and IL-13 both um, drive allergic inflammation and both share the, a common receptor. Um, IL-13 promotes generation of eosinophil chemo chemoattractants and also causes airway smooth muscle um, contractility. And it's um, important in the secretion of periostin, which is a cellular protein that's being used as a biomarker as a measure of this Th2 inflammation or IL-13 induced inflammation. And there's multiple different monoclonal antibodies looking at anti-IL-13 therapy. I'm just going to touch on one, which is the lebrachis... The, the L1 like is, um, <laughs> so this is a humanized IgG4 monoclonal anti-IL-13 antibody. And in the trials, there was a fairly big trial, 200 patients with poorly controlled, what they deemed poorly controlled asthma. So they were on that final steps, um, five or six therapy, not doing well. And they received either lebrachizumab or uh, placebo, and as you can see here, they, they followed this for 32 weeks. This is the change in FEV1. This, the top bar is the drug and the bottom bar is with placebo. And you do have this increase in FEV1 with the anti-IL-13 antibody. Now, if you tried to tease this out and pull out only the patients that had this high periostin. So this marker for IL-13 inflammation or um, Th2 inflammation, this group had more of an increase in their FEV1. And if you look at just the low periostin group, obviously they didn't have as, as um, good of a benefit. So, you know, it, it tells us a couple things. One, you know, one, some of this IL-13 could be a potential therapeutic blockade to improve not only quality of life and exacerbations, but maybe FEV1, and also that maybe periostin is a good biomarker to help us predict who's going to respond to this medication. The other um, cytokine we were talking about is IL-4. So IL-4 promotes B-cell isotype switching to IgE. It promotes eosinophil migration to the lungs, and it upregulates mucus secretion. Um, there's been multiple different approaches to blocking IL-4. A few of them failed in the trials because they actually had increased musculoskeletal side effects. But one... Um, medication that has, we, we talked about before, and I believe Dr. Looney had mentioned, is this dupilumab. So it actually blocks the IL-4 receptor. So as we said before, IL-4 and IL-13 both share a similar subunit at the receptor, so this has the benefit of blocking the effect of both. So one of the trials here was a, um, patients who had persistent persistent to moderate to severe asthma, so not all severe asthmatics, and had a high blood eosinophil count. Um, 
received either the dupilumab or placebo once a week. And the interesting thing about this trial was they were testing whether dupilumab could be used instead of, as an alternative to traditional asthmatic therapy, so inhaled corticosteroids. So these patients were actually weaned off of their LABAs and then asked to discontinue their inhaled corticosteroids. And I guess not surprisingly, they saw this big decrease in exacerbations. This is the washout of the LABA period and then the discontinuation of the inhaled corticosteroids. And what you see is the patients that came off of their medications had this big increase in exacerbation while the dupilumab group was pretty much stable on weaning their medications. Um, if you look at FEV1, you see the dupilumab group, which is in the blue, had the increase in FEV1 over the placebo patients and some of the other scores that we use, um, waking at night, were also improved or decreased in the dupilumab group versus the placebo. Now once again, this you know you can take this with a grain of salt because these patients weren't kept on sort of standard of care therapy. They were comparing this versus taking off of their, med you know, weaning off of their standard medications. But regardless, the dupilumab group, at least if you look at exacerbations, remained pretty stable. So the actual numbers, there was actually an 87% reduction in exacerbations versus placebos if you use dupilumab. Um, there were some significant improvements in lung function and asthma control as we showed in the FEV1 and nighttime awakening. And like I said, this was design wasn't to be used as an add-on therapy as most of these trials have been, but more as um, to show that it could substitute for inhaled corticosteroids and LAVAs. The, the last um, medication I'm gonna touch on is this anti-TSLP. So TSLP is thymic stromolymphopoietin. It's an epithelial cell derived cytokine that's um, produced in response to pro-inflammatory stimuli and drives allergic inflammation and um, through, it, through its effects on mast cells and other um, and DCs. And we've seen that the level of TSLP, mRNA, and protein are increased in airways of asthmatics. And interestingly, there's a SNP that's been associated with actually protection to asthma and a SNP um, of TSLP. So this seems to play some fairly critical role in the development, at least in some patients with asthma. So this was also an interesting design. They took patients with, um, with asthma and they did skin tests to find out what they were allergic to. And then they used an allergen challenge, which was based on the con concentration that would create a two millimeter wheel. And they challenged the patients with this, their, the, the specific allergen that they were reacted to at, multiple times and then they gave the the dose of um, the anti-TSLP and their main outcome was to measure the delayed um, hyperreactivity response so as a measure of decrease in FEV1 after this allergen challenge. So this is the at the beginning day minus 14 and as you see, as you get to day 42 and 82, these patients, the decrease in their FEV1 was less with the anti-TSLP antibody, meaning they could tolerate their allergen challenge better with a, a, a lower decrease in their lung function. And if you look at some of the other biomarkers that we've been looking at, the blood eosinophils, the sputum eosinophils, FENO, all of these also seem to be decreased with the anti-TSLP antibody. So, you know, as of now, there's multiple different 
medications that they're targeting. A few of these have been approved. Um, some of these I haven't touched on, and these are some of the ones that are also being looked at, some of the other targets um, that, that people are looking at specifically in asthma. You know, this is the most recent full list of what these medications are. Some have been, like I said, approved. Some are in different phases of clinical trials. A few have been discontinued. But this field in asthma is growing. Um, I think the, the, the fact that we had previously, you know, just been treating people with this step-up therapy and taking all oncomers as, as being equal and haven't been, I guess, tr establishing patients into different phenotypes with different biomarkers and, um, and um, different endotypes even to try to personalize treatment you know, hasn't, hasn't allowed us to push past this. But I think with the advent of some of these new biologics and some of the improvements in the pathophysiology of what we're understanding of asthma, I think this is more of where it's going. You know, we're, if they are easy to control asthma, we'll still sort of stick to the step-up therapy. But once this gets to be this severe asthma phenotype, we're hoping to have different biomarkers, like we said, the periostin, some of these other things, and be able to choose some of these immunologic cytokine blockades to personalize which medication would be better for certain patients, which ones would maybe other patients wouldn't respond to, maybe use these as add-on agents to the, the standardized step-up therapy, and in the end, hopefully decrease you know, the overall burden that asthma has on the, the quality of life of the patient, the medical field in general. So I think, you know, conclusions, like I said, you know, this is a di diverse disease. It's highly variable. Um, I think the way we're going is to, you know, try to better pinpoint the phenotypes and phenotype these patients and personalized care rather than just treat everybody just purely based on their symptoms.